got Dr. Jay Cohen in the studio, uh, just down the road, actually. You uh, at Nova University and clinic, uh, the clerkship director for the uh, allopathic uh, OBGYN department, uh, the third year medical students. There you go. So uh, very, very fortunate to have you and and your expertise on today's podcast because we have a lot of women that are uh, two topics come to mind and areas that women probably consistently want to have some more background to and and we're going to touch on those today one of them is uh women that come to your office that have fibroids and the other one is a, another topic of birth control and you know how do we how do we manage it um not only from pregnancy standpoint but then also from the standpoint of uh you know just health and wellness right so so how to keep your levels appropriate and we're going to chat about some of those things so in the, in the in the area of 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 fibroids what is it that uh a young lady or a, a, a woman that enters your office what's their what's your chief complaint that they're gonna yeah well yeah, look, probably one of the most common things that we see in our office besides uh, problems as far as uh, discharge, yeast infections, uh, and also well women visits that markedly encompass um, uh, birth control itself, depending on the population that we have, it, is that probably about 60 to 70 percent of our patients will have uterine fibroids, that common. And, you know, when I was at University of Miami, they called them fireballs in the uterus. Uh, yeah, there's different uh, names for all these. And what, what they are is they're basically smooth muscle because the uterus is made up of a tissue called smooth muscle, a type of muscle. And if you picture a, a piece of uh, uh, the way cotton candy is made, how they go swirl, wind around and around, it's made up of like single cells that go round and around and around and around, and they can be extremely large. Right. Um, they could be in different locations. The majority of patients are, have no symptoms. They're picked up either on exam or when they're pregnant and they have an ultrasound and they see them. Uh, they could be located in different areas of the uterus. Either they could be hanging off like a mushroom called pedunculated or just under the capsule or the outside of the uterus called subserosal in the muscle called intramural or in the cavity itself where women shed and bleed from called submucosal. Okay. So the majority of women will do well, but the majority of women that when they come to see us, if there's problems, they'll probably be complaining of either pressure or bleeding. About 25% of patients with uterine fibroids are symptomatic. The others will not. And the majority of women will live their entire lives with them and go into their 80s and 90s until and be in, go to their grave with them, so to speak. Right, so, right, right. <clears throat> so 25% so, so of the population will come in with a, with a complaint. Um, the rest will either, to your point, either if they're going into surgery or maybe they're having a hysterectomy, right? Then they'll, then you'll. Well, be seen. yeah. I mean, the number one cause of hysterectomy in this country is from uterine fibroids. And the majority of the time, it's either because of heavy bleeding. Uh, fibroids are more common in our black population than in our white. Um, and um, we spend about $32 billion a year just on fibroids in this country, 32 billion with surgical approach, healthcare, medications. But we're very fortunate now because years and years ago, I mean, I don't want to date myself, but when I came out of residency, we really didn't have a lot for them. And we just treat, uh, treat symptomatic. But times have really changed now to the point where we have a lot of different modalities of treatment to try and prevent our patients from heading into an operating room or having a hysterectomy. I mean, we've just all gone through COVID. A lot of patients don't want to be admitted to the hospitals right now or go under that or uh, any type of anesthesia. So the question is, is how do we take care of our patients conservatively? And right. that's that's where we're at right now. And that's a new hot topic because of the new medications or some of the procedures that are out there. So, so let's focus on medication. So what, so what can you do from a medication standpoint that's going to help these ladies? Well, that's a good question. So we always start at step A and go to step G, uh, B, C, D. So really for a lot of these patients, when they present, they're a lot younger to us. And a lot of times we could use a birth control pill. Okay. A birth control pill, meaning just not for birth control, but it has a lot of what we call non-contraceptive benefits. So less bleeding means less cramping. They, Even though you'd think that these what fuels fibroids is estrogen, and birth control pills have estrogen, but it seems not to increase the size 
uh, fibroids. But we can start with that to help to control. If it's just pressure or cramping or pain, we can start with the non-steroidal. The, the Advils, the Anaprox that were there. A lot of, there's a new medication, not new, but a medication we've been using called TXA, transemic acid. And they take two pills three times a day for five days with their period. It cuts your bleeding basically in half. Fantastic. Okay. Great. And that's not a birth control pill. And that's only used period because a lot of people don't want to take a daily medications. Right. Is that an over-the-counter or is that a prescription? Oh, no, this is all prescription and okay. we, this is all prescribed. Um, another thing that we have is we have a brand new and we're very privileged to do some of the clinical trials on it called GNRH antagonists. GNRH antagonists will inhibit the area in the brain that causes women to ovulate. It shuts down the ovaries. And by doing that, it has two folds. It, if it shuts down that, it shuts down that the amount that they bleed. And the current data shows that within four weeks, you can decrease 50% of the bleeding, 50%. So if a woman bleeds at a 150 mils, which is like eight teaspoons or some clotting, it markedly cuts it down half with as quick as four to eight weeks. And that's only used for 24 months. The medicine is also used for people with with endometriosis or pelvic pain or pain with their periods or with intercourse or et cetera. So it has a dual indication. That's a medication called Mifimbri. Now we also have medications like Lupron. The problem with medications like Lupron, even though it shuts down and puts a woman into temporary menopause to shrink the fibroids temporarily is the probability that they're going to have a lot of night sweats, hot flashes and problems. Mm -hmm. And they're going to feel like they're in menopause and it's a shot. So it's, you can't stop it where the other medication I presented is oral and it readily reverses itself. So the birth control pills, the non-steroidals, the, the gonadotropin releasing hormone called my Fimbri or what we had on the market, the lupaloids, okay, the transemic acid. These are all where we're at with the use of medications to help prevent our patients from heading to an operating room or help them symptomatically or help them get to menopause where there won't be bleeding and where the fibroids won't grow anymore because that's fueled by estrogen and menopause. We know there's minimal to no estrogen. Right, right. And so if they, if, if, if step A doesn't work now, we're thinking, okay, step B and, and is that an in-office or is that now heading yeah, to the operator? That's, that, that's a great question. So the question is, is the location of the fibroids. So say that they're refractive to medical management. Okay. Or patients come in and they say, look, I've had it. You know, I, I, I'm bleeding. I have anemia. I'm tired of being iron, on iron. I'm, 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 extre I'm extremely exhausted. It's hard for me to work. And I'm done having my children. What do you have? Well, there's minimally invasive procedures that are out there now, too. So a lot of times we'll do a transvaginal ultrasound or an ultrasound above. Mm -hmm. We'll see where the fibroids located. Okay, so we could offer our patients a couple things. Number one. We could, if it's in, in the cavity, a lot of times we could take our patients and they're not too big. We could take our patients to the operating room as an outpatient where they go home that day. We put a, a scope, a camera inside the cervix up into the uterus. And we have a little instrument called a myoshore that eats away at the fibroids, depending on the size of it. We can do that. And at the same time, if the cavity is not too big or too distorted, we could actually burn out the lining of the uterus called uh, endometrial ablation. We ablate, we burn through radio frequency waves. It has about a 65% success rate of no, no more cycles. Not only that, it has a, the people that do bleed, about 80% will be markedly less. If that, not considering that, there's something called uterine artery um, embolization, where we send you to an interventional radiologist. They will actually go to the groin, put seeds in where the, the uterus gets the majority of its blood supply called the uterine artery. Mm -hmm. And they will seed that area and block it off. It's a little painful for these patients, but it will markedly decrease the size of the uterus. And then hopefully, and markedly decrease the amount of bleeding, hopefully these patients won't need a hysterectomy. Right, so these, all. all of these, I was gonna say, all these techniques are, are hysterectomy sparing. Yes, exactly right. Now we also have a procedure where we threw a laparoscope through the belly button, and then we introduce a, a probe that will go into the fibroids that we see, and then we it's radio frequency and burns them out. Okay. Okay. So these are all new type procedures that we're doing. 
Okay, now if a person wants to preserve their uterus also, and the fibroids are large, and they've had maybe recurrent miscarriages, or they're having bleeding, and they don't want a hysterectomy, or they want more children, right. we can always go in and just remove the fibroids. Good. And so the uterus back up, called right. a myomectomy. Mm -hmm. The problem with that sometimes is that if the patient does want to have more children, a lot of these patients will need a cesarean delivery. That's because we've disrupted the fibers of that and we put them at a slightly increased risk of rupture of the uterus. And then if none of that works, then we're looking at uh, hysterectomy or removing of the uterus right. with sparing of those tubes and ovaries possibly, or depending on what they discuss with their physician. And, and what percentage of that population has to then move to a... Uh, uh removal of the uterus yeah. well, i would tell you that After going through all of those right sure i would tell you that probably right now the um, i think the amount of hysterectomies are in a big downturn because of the minimally invasive procedures that we are doing and with the new medications that are out even though it's only good for you know 24 months because we don't know what it does to the bone even though i believe it's readily reversible but i would tell you that probably end up about 10 10 to 15 percent okay <clears throat> which is not a not a large number well, it's decreasing, which right. is good. I right. mean, look, it all boils down the amount of money we're spending and the OR time and et cetera. Everything is heading toward trying to lower your healthcare costs. And this would be part, some of the reasons what we, we try to. Right. Keep them, keep, them, keep them out of the operating room and do as many things as you can prior to that. And then, of course, when you are um, sending them back to the OR, if you can get them home that night, even better. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so, uh so you touched on a little bit the the use of birth control, mm -hmm. and and one of those those areas is is people always think birth control, pregnancy, um, and and that's usually the first and foremost focus. But it has so many other benefits. Can we maybe walk through? Um, let's start with the would start with the maybe the teenager. And then you have someone who, you know, is in their 20s, 30s, and then and then how you utilize birth control yeah. for someone who's middle I mean, aged or look, pre birth pre control is now more important than anything else. 50% of the pregnancies in this country are unintended. 50%. And okay. I, and a lot of those, <laughs> there you go. Well, that was not bad then. So 50% unintended. The reason this is becoming into such a play now is because we have legislation changes depending on what state and where you're at. I mean, we're even waiting on Florida now. I hope it doesn't happen, but we're, we're waiting on Florida. They, they now considering changing that after six weeks and there's a heartbeat, that's it, no termination. Patients have to get in the car and go to somewhere else into a different state. So it's become more important now to try, especially with our younger population, et cetera, because the greatest risk for unintended pregnancy occur in our teenagers okay, and in our perimenopausal patients because they feel they're getting too old to get pregnant, all right? And in our teenagers, just lack of responsibility where condoms just aren't important anymore. And the problem is, is, is that the boys who are much younger think with the wrong head, so to speak, okay? Um, so the question is, 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 is how do we take care of our, our patients now? So with 50% unintended, we have, you know, for our younger patients, a lot of them had birth control pills. Now, I always say to my patients, oh, I don't want to take a pill every day. I says, well, you walk into my office, you barely look at me because you're on your phone. So obviously, they all have iPhones. They can set their damn alarm every night to take their pill. So that's number one. But what's become more and more in vogue with these younger uh, uh, things is that we're, there's a bigger push for placing intrauterine devices or, in, or I, what we call IUDs. Mm -hmm. So... For a lot, of, a lot of these younger kids, they may be missing school for, there's a lot of reasons why they may go on a pill. Forget even about birth control, they may be having pain with, because we know that, that endometriosis starts in, usually in their teenagers. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them may be missing school, have pain with their periods, okay? Um, and, and you wanna help these kids. The way to do it is to shut down the area in the brain that helps cause them to ovulate, et cetera. So in our younger kids, like you mentioned, the birth control pill is extremely an important tool for us yeah. or instrument because we know that the pill will decrease bleeding. Less bleeding means less cramping because of something called less prostaglandin, which constantly puts women in labor. You can imagine the cramping. Yep. It, in, it pulls free testosterone from the body. So it helps with acne. Mm -hmm. Okay. It also prevents future ovarian cysts, not current ones. So it shuts down the ovary. 
And if patients have been on it for six years, et cetera, that decreases the risk for cancer of the ovary and the uterus. Right. A lot so of, a lot of along with 99 point percent, as long as it's used correctly, the true index is 80, 98 percent will not become uh, uh, pregnant using a birth control pill. So I believe for our younger population, it's if they remember to take it, it's a very valuable tool, but it does not, and I'll say it again, does not replace condoms, especially. So when I get parents in here and they bring their kids that are 16, 15, 17 years old, I always have the parents wait outside because I want to get the real story because every parent always says to me, oh, not my kid. They're a good girl. So I'm thinking to myself, does that mean that good girls don't have sex? Okay. Right. So, which is, which is crazy. So, and then I look at the mom and I say, well, what were you doing at 17 and 16 and the whole bit? Right. So I always have my parents wait outside to get the whole story. So that's when I'm able to talk to them about condoms, about uh, birth control and in younger kids. So people that are in their twenties and thirties. Now, if that doesn't work well for them and they can't hey, remember. Let me, let me pause there. I just kind of want to, I want to close out the younger patient. If you had a, um, a score or a rating between the IUD and birth control, what would be your preference and, and, and then how okay. you differentiate? For me, it would be, well, it depends it, who I'm talking to, but the problem with the younger kids, they've never had children and the cervix is usually has never been dilated. So they may be afraid of placing that IUD. That's right. From the cervix being closed and it may hurt them. And a lot of them, this will be their first or second GYN exam. And it may markedly turn them off toward the gynecologist if they have pain. Etc. That's why we don't start pap smears till 21. And patients that come see me, I, I don't even do a pelvic exam on them if they've never had intercourse or they're not using tampons. I usually do a, an ultrasound from above, okay. you know, to look at pelvic anatomy if I'm going to start them for bad periods, etc. So, so my preference would be the pill because also a lot of these kids have problems with acne and it decreases their their acne and pulls for what we call free testosterone from the blood, which causes acne in women. So, or if they're not going to take the pills and they're not going to allow me to think, then I would consider like shots called Depo-Provera. Okay. okay. Or in my 17, 18 year olds, I could put a rod into the arm right. that just, that is progesterone only has some bleeding, but nothing associated with it, but that's good where they don't even have to worry about them taking the pills. Yeah. Okay. Because no, they don't no. have, to, yeah, they don't have to remember. So, but that's, that's what we, which, which is available for them also. So there's a lot of different forms of birth control that are available for them. I could even put a ring in that's in for three weeks and out one week. They okay. just got to, people, you got to make sure they want to touch us. And now we have the new ring that's out there called Anavera, where they don't have to keep going to the pharmacy. That's good for one year, but it's three weeks in one week out, three, but it's the same ring where they don't have to keep going. Okay. And I've known patients that leave it in for six months, three months, four months at a time without a problem. That's and that's the, some of the new type of birth control that's coming out now. But birth control is no good unless your patient takes it. Right. So compliance. it can be the greatest birth control in the world. But if there's no compliance, it's the worst birth control in the world. That's why it's so important that we need to speak to our patients and, and to the patients and, and find out how reliable and responsible they are. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody's got like to your point. Everyone has a phone. Everyone has an alarm. Yeah. Everyone has, you know, set that. Everyone. Yeah, but but somehow they still get pregnant and have unintended pregnancies. True, true. So yes, we try to you know try to have as many you know backup plans as possible. To your point, you know, sex with condoms uh, reduce the STDs and you know a lot of other benefits that yeah. bind to and, that. And education, and I always encourage them to speak to their their mother. Okay. Um, I really do. I think that's got to be their best friend. And somehow they feel that their parents have never had sex, but, you know, and go for advice and, and et cetera. I would have them do that than go to their 16 or 17 year old girlfriend who's there right. that they, the expert or nowadays head to the chat rooms or to social net media. Exactly. Exactly. So now we, so younger population talk a little bit about that. Now you have someone who is in their, you know, late twenties, 30s, you know, how do you manage that patient? And what do you, what do yeah, you well, it, it, it depends. The birth control pill is still probably the number one use for a lot, of, a lot of physicians or midwives or healthcare or PCPs or whoever, you know, the nurse practitioner that are out there that, that prescribe. But I'm becoming extremely favorable on the IUDs nowadays okay. because number, number one, we have an assortment of them. 
and we have ones with hormones and people hear the word hormone and they think it's going throughout the body. We don't really know how uh, IUDs work. We know it's not something that causes abortion. We think that the progesterone in it may call, be deleterious to the sperm, may cause a very thickened mucosa that the sperm can't move. The copper we know kills if, if it's the non-hormonal. But I like the IUD because and there's a big push for the IUD to be used now in this country. We're like so far behind from third world countries with IUDs. And the reason is it takes the responsibility away from the patient. Right. So to me, if a, a woman has to be a good candidate, she, you know, I always ask her, make sure she doesn't have multiple sexual partners. She hasn't had a, a, a history of gonorrhea, chlamydia. If she has treated, and it was years ago, and yep. she's gotten smart since then, condoms, et cetera. But for the person that's monogamous, that's had a child, or even not had a child, but monogamous in a stable relationship, does not really tolerant to taking birth control pills or does not want to take or forgets, the IUD is absolutely a, a perfect form of birth control that's about 99.2% effective. Also, with one called Mirena, which has a progesterone in it, it has tool in, two indications because it's used for heavy menstrual bleeding. Right. So we use it in our women that are 30s, 40s, up into up into to menopause. And that's good now is just approved for birth control for eight years for heavy menstrual bleeding still at five years. There's a non-hormonal IUD called Paragard, which has copper around it. That's good for 10 years. Okay. But for it, they're all easy to place. The chance of infection is minimal. The risk of perforating the uterus when you put it in is about one per ten, one per thousand. And the chance of it falling out is about two to three percent or two to three per hundred. What I do is I bring my patients back in three to four weeks after placement just to make sure that the it's still up into the fundal part of the uterus. Right. Okay, the fallopian tubes. And that's how we check. And I tell them to be careful in the meantime. But I, I love that. Now, if they don't want it, there's always the birth control pill, especially in our patients that are in their late 30s, 40s, that may be perimenopausal, that are having some problems with bleeding. And we investigate to make sure the bleeding is nothing serious. These are patients that could go on a birth control pill to really not only help with birth control, but also remember the highest risk of unintended pregnancy, teenagers and women in their mid 40s, et cetera but also to help them with bleeding patterns that they're fine. So the, then there's the shots, there's also permanent sterilization. And nowadays what we're doing is we're taking the tubes out when we do a tubal ligation. Why? Because now some data stays that they think that maybe ovarian cancer, even though it's extremely uncommon, may start with it from the tubes. So when we do a tubal, we used to just take pieces of the tube. Now we take the tube itself. All right, All right. start to finish when you do it. Um, and so if you, so now post menopausal, what's your, um, technique, what's your algorithm for treating those patients? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, that's that because we live in a, a very controversial society right now about where we're at with treating and hormone therapy. Cause in 1992, when I was in practice two years, I got calls from all my patients of why I was trying to kill them because the women's health initiative or the WHI came out with was just Premarin and Provera, which we hardly use anymore. Okay. And basically said that we're increasing our risk for breast cancer, stroke, okay. Uh, cardiovascular events, no help with dementia. And it didn't really help with urinary loss. I used to get women being sent to me in their eighties to be put on hormone therapy, not because of hot flashes or whatever, because we were always led to believe that it, it's helpful for preventing heart disease. And then when we saw this increased risk. So we've now really gotten smart. We know now that we really don't start our patients into the late 60s and 70s because they've already developed the so-called plaque. And they may this plaque may lead to problems. And that's the women in the WHI that was started were in their 60s. But we know now that if we look at our women that are in their early 50s, mm -hmm. Start them on hormone replacement because the average age of menopause in this country is 51.5 years of age. There's a, the night sweats, hot flashes, oh, three, four years later, vaginal dryness, harder to achieve orgasm, loss of skin turgor, joint pain, insomnia. Okay, it's a the big, list goes on and on, right? Yes, well, it's a big change for these women because their kids are leaving from school, they're not getting their periods. They're by, they go from a pear shape to an apple shape, develop central obesity, increased risk, and, and they start looking at themselves as being old. So there's a huge psychological component here. Sure. So I'm very big on hormone therapy, and uh, we have a lot of so-called bioidenticals. Mm -hmm. The problem with this now is, is that people think that they can go get pellets in their, uh, for testosterone in the, in the buttocks area. A lot of this stuff is not FDA approved. 
okay? It's compounded. We don't know what's in it. Right. So a lot of people come and said, I'm spending $300 a month for compounding. I'm putting this gel on and this, and this pharmacist is making it. We don't know what's in it because it's not FDA regulated. So that's why there's medications out now in a pill form that are only FDA approved called Bijuva. That's bioidentical, okay, with it, with estradiol and progesterone. There's creams that are FDA approved. So mm -hmm. I use a lot more and only the FDA approved type bioidenticals that are available. And it's no one catch thing for patients, meaning that, that if you think there's a magic wand for hormone therapy, it's not. You got to educate your patients. You got to work with them. You got to adjust dosing. Let them know there may be some spotting, maybe some bloating. But if everything goes well, about within four to six weeks after starting it, eighty percent of their symptoms should be gone. Also, the non the non the benefits that they don't feel it decreases or it prevents osteoporosis and decreases colorectal cancer. And the risk of breast cancer is minimal. It's about three per ten thousand. Okay. You so sleep better. And they're significant. Their other is, is happier. Well, it's not only that, but the world is but, happy. Their kids are happier. Everything. But when they sleep better, okay, emotionally they're gonna feel better. Right. When the light sweats, lead hot flashes, it's all, all gonna go hand in hand. Okay, so so all this is important, but every person needs to be treated as individual. Just like with anything else, there's contraindications of previous history of pulmonary embolism, deep vein thrombosis. Just like I don't put patients on birth control pills if they smoke over the age of 35 or have had a strong, we got to watch blood pressure, et cetera. So I talk in a generic form, but every person, you got to look at what they may have or what contraindications are, which is important, which is outlined by the FDA. Yeah, absolutely. And so from a, from a, a cream perspective, a gel perspective, what do you... What's your go-to at this point? You know. Yeah, I use estrogel. These are all bioidentical estrogens um, uh, that you can put on. There's rings that go inside. I'm not a big user of because a lot of women complain of some discharge. But where they wake up every morning, they apply the gel, and then but they if they have a uterus, they have to take a progesterone with it to prevent the lining of the uterus from being built up. Otherwise, over time, that may lead to cancer of the uterus. But if they don't have a uterus. Okay, then you could just apply the gels because you're not worried about endometrial problems. There's no lining. Right. And I have patients that are into their 60s, 70s, even 80s that refuse to go off. As long as we do blood, as long as you check their blood pressure, see them once a year. Uh, we do mammograms. They've had their colonoscopy, everything. I have no problem continuing. Yeah. So they feel better. Uh, well, you know. Yeah. And you got to worry about vaginal dryness, too. These women are still very sexually active. And so within about three to four years after menopause, they start developing dryness called genital urinary symptoms of menopause called GSM, make it an increased urinary tract infections, et cetera. So I think it's extremely important. So if they don't want to take the pills and they just have symptoms down below, we have topical estrogens that we can give our patients that are not absorbed. So it's not like they think they're taking it systemically. But there's still a, a stigma out there about estrogen and breast cancer. So it's important to educate your patients. A lot of, yeah, a lot of education. That's what, you know, our goal of, of having this program is for women to be able to, you know, log in, listen to our conversation. There is a lot to unpack. Um, we're going to we're gonna add some edits to it. Uh, some of the things that you talked about today. We're going to, you know, throw them up in our site so that then people can get some access and and then also educate themselves uh, and certainly appreciate the time. No, all, Rob, this, all, all, this, all, this, all this information, you know, you're, you're and, and there's still a lot more. We we've, we've just touched on a few subjects. We touched on That's it. it. And, and, and so, you know, people go to the go to the Venue Health uh, by Arms Medical and you'll see the. This will be posted here uh, this weekend. Um, we we'll also get the ladies to add some comments, you know, maybe questions that that they're thinking about or questions that they feel weren't answered uh, like they wanted it or curious about X, Y, Z because their friend is on it, you know, so we'll they can add some questions to it and then we can answer some of those questions next time you're back on the program. So it'd good? be a privilege. And thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Okay. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.